Oh, that's loud, isn't it? Hello. <laughs> I can't really see you out there. Um, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Cook. Dot com is my website. That's where you can check me out. I am the MD and business editor of CompleteMusicUpdate.com. That's our website, um, or CMU for short. And we call ourselves a service provider to the music industry. We're based in London. We are best known for our news services, including our free CMU Daily Bulletin that goes out each morning. We also have an education program for young artists called CMU DIY. And we have a training and consultancy business called CMU Insights, which is why I am here today. So um, just over two years ago, we were commissioned by the Music Managers Forum uh, in the UK, which is the biggest, biggest trade organization of artist managers in the world, to undertake a major piece of research which went by the name Dissecting the Digital Dollar. And the aim of this research was to explain for the first time in one place how streaming services of the Spotify variety were being licensed by the music industry. Also to consider the issues with the current licensing model, mainly from an artist's perspective, and also to explain what happens to digital income, streaming income, as it flows from a DSP, a digital service provider, through record companies and music publishers to artists and songwriters. So that was the aim of the report. It comes in two parts. We published part one about a year ago. It tells you how a streaming service is licensed and explains the copyright law and contractual conventions around that model. We then identified seven issues, and earlier this year we staged a series of roundtables, mainly in the UK, but also in France, Canada, and the US, involving artists and songwriters and lawyers and accountants, labels and publishers, and lots and lots of managers discussing those issues. And part two of the report that came out about a month ago basically summarizes those discussions. The reports are available for free. I actually have some printed copies of the executive summary of part two, which I will dish out later. But you can download both reports for free from the MMF website as PDFs. Now, I only have a few minutes with you here today. What I want to do with those few minutes is a couple of things. First of all, to explain why this report was necessary. Then to give you a few bullet points in two minutes, how a streaming service is licensed and what happens to the money. And finally, with any minutes I have left before the panel that's coming on after me, I'll talk through some of the key issues that we raised with the way streaming services are currently licensed by the music industry and the way the money flows through the system. So to explain why the report was necessary. Um, this model explains how a CD, a compact disc, works from a copyright and royalties perspective. Okay? Some of you in the room with a background in music, that diagram will make perfect sense to you. Some of you it may not. However, I think you can see it's a relatively simple model in terms of how the copyright licensing works and what happens to the money. It's certainly a lot simpler than this. This is how a streaming service is licensed. As you can see, it's quite complex for various reasons. And the reason the Music Managers Forum commissioned this work was that they were finding that their managers, who they represent, were increasingly being asked questions by their artists that they could not answer about how the streaming income that they were receiving was being calculated by both the service and their record companies and music publishers. So as I say, let's give you a little, little bit of information about how a Spotify type service is licensed. If you are setting up one of these services tomorrow, the first thing to say is that you would need to do two sets of deals, one around the sound recording copyrights and another around the song copyrights. Because as far as copyright law is concerned, songs and recordings are two separate things, even if the same person both writes and performs the song. The record industry generally licenses through direct deals, whereas music publishers license through the collective licensing system, through the collecting societies, with the exception of the awkward big five who choose to license Anglo-American repertoire directly directly, which means that you would have to do these deals first with the record industry, with the free majors, with an organization called Merlin, which represents about half of the indie labels worldwide, and then a bunch of distributors. That would get you both the content and permission to exploit the sound recording copyright, and then you'd need to do these deals with the big five publishers to access that Anglo-American repertoire, and then with every collecting society in the world that represents song rights, of which there are about 150, although some of them in Europe in particular are now collaborating on this. So you can do a deal with an organization called ICE and another called Armonia and get a big chunk of the European repertoire in one go. 
In terms of what the deal looks like, it is fundamentally a revenue share deal based on consumption share. Um, in terms of what rev share, every deal is different, most deals are secret, but in the main, labels are looking for 55 to 60% of any revenue attributed to their catalogue, while publishers are looking for about 10 to 15%, which leaves the DSP with about 30% of the money, except there are other elements to the deal as well, in particular, a whole bunch of minimum guarantees, which is why even the most successful streaming services rarely keep more than about 15% of their revenue, even though in theory they're on a 30% revenue share arrangement. That's an issue for the streaming services. In terms of issues from an artist perspective, these are four of the issues that we cover in the report and we discussed in our roundtables earlier this year, some of which we will then be discussing on the panel that's following me, which I will be participating in. First things first is how the money is shared. Um, as you will see from this diagram, the way it is set up, the sound recording copyright sees four to five times more of the money than the song or publishing copyright. In terms of what artists and songwriters see, that depends on their record deal or their publishing deal. But as you can see in the main, certainly when it comes to a major record company, the label sees way more money than everybody else. Songwriters, artists, publishers will tell you that is neither fair nor sustainable. Unsurprisingly, the record companies do not agree. Uh, another issue is data. How do the services know who to give this money to? On the recording side, they give the money to whoever provides the content. But on the publishing side, they don't know who owns the song copyright. They don't even know which song copyright is being exploited. This is because of rubbish data in the music industry. And the music industry is desperately trying to sort out its music rights data to make this process more efficient. Transparency is probably the single biggest issue from an artist's perspective. There was a lot of mysteries surrounding the way streaming services are licensed. We've solved some of those mysteries with the Dissecting the Digital Dollar report. However, artists and songwriters rarely know the specifics of the deals which are used to calculate what money they are due. And for most artists and songwriters and their managers, that is the single biggest issue. Finally, there is the fact that streaming music is a fundamentally different business model to the old CD or even the download business. We are no longer in the business of first week sales. In the olden days, it was all about getting a sale when your album was put on the market and you got all your money in on week one and everybody was happy. That's not how it works in the streaming age. How much you sell in the first week is irrelevant. You need to get repeat listens again and again and again and again so that slowly but surely that money slips in. And eventually, you might pass that white line and actually go into profit. The question is, will your songs and recordings get that many repeat listens? Is your record company marketing with repeat listens in mind? And even if it works, can you afford to wait one, two, three, four years for the money to drip in? The fact is that streaming is a model that works really well for some artists and is putting other artists out of business, which might just be a fact of life or it might be the single biggest challenge that the wider music community needs to address. I'm out of time, however. If uh, you want to read either of these reports, you can download them for free, either from the MMF website, or if you go to this link on my website, you can download both copies on part one and part two of the report. And if they're of interest, the slides you've just seen are available to download as a PDF on that website too. And if you uh, are interested in this, we do seminars on digital licensing, so you can come and talk to me about that later. And do sign up to the CMU Daily Bulletin, where we will update you on all of the developments in streaming music and as these issues are addressed. So look at that. It says I'm over time. And I'm over time clashing with myself, because I'm now clashing the panel I'm about to sit on. So I'll hand back to our host to introduce what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Chris. Give a warm uh, uh, a round of applause. Some really, really interesting stuff, and I'll, I'm sure I'll be, I'll be checking out CMU Insights later, as purely as a, from an artist's perspective.